I think the next bit I'll talk about is the basic operation of a condenser microphone. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. um, let's just say we've got a fixed electrode here mm -hmm. and we've got a flappy electrode here. And just for the hell of it, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to ground that one. Yep. And we're going to polarise that one with a polarising voltage. We'll mm -hmm. call it positive for the moment. Yep. And we'll feed that onto there via a high value resistor. Mm -hmm. How high? How high? Really high. high. Hundreds of megs. Uh, quite often gig ohms. Gig ohms. Yep. Reason being, the capacitance between that flappy electrode and mm. that one there is of the order, well, for a, for a little electric microphone, and obviously this is not an electric microphone because yep. we're externally polarising it, Yes. it might be about five puff. Right. Maybe seven puff, maybe four puff, that order of magnitude. For a larger studio microphone, it might be between 50 puff and 100 puff. Mm -hmm. Low capacitances. Yep. And we need a high resistance here for reasons to be explained in a second. All right. What we've done here is, let's say that's about 100 volts. Uh, in a measurement microphone, such mm -hmm. as a Bruel and Kerr microphone, yep. uh, which is externally polarised, they would typically use a 200 volt polarising voltage. Mm -hmm. The uh, studio condenser capsule which we had a little look at, uh, you might polarise it with somewhere around about the 60 volt, maybe even 90 volt mark. Okay. The amount of charge varies, but the whole point is we've got a capacitor here that we've put charge into, onto. Yep. It'll charge up over a period of some seconds, because mm -hmm. we've got gig ohms there and a few picofarads there, so it'll so it charge up. take a couple of seconds after power on? To yeah. Uh, so uh, somebody out there can calculate the time constant between, uh, uh, well, no, bugger it, let's mm. do it here. Uh, let's say we've got uh, 10 to the 9 ohms there. Yep. And let's say we've got uh, 50 times 10 to the minus 12 farads mm. there. Okay, that comes to about uh, 50 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds, I think. Oh, yeah. Sounds about right. Reasonable. So. 50 milliseconds time constant. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, that's an un uh, that, that, that would be an unrealistically low value, but it's right. some that older microphone manufacturers use. So we've got a 50 millisecond charge time constant there, mm -hmm. uh, which incidentally will wind up corresponding to an electrical roll-off pole there of it's about six hertz. Okay, that's fifty milliseconds time constant. Yep. Uh, one over fifty milliseconds is twenty hertz. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, actually, the uh, with a twenty with a twenty hertz time constant, the actual minus three dB frequency right. will be uh, two uh, two pi lower than that, which mm -hmm. is about three hertz. Got it. Yeah, fairly typical. Anyway, charges up, we've got a charge there. What happens when we come along with a pressure wave onto that mm -hmm. diaphragm? It decreases the distance between the plates, increases the capacitance. Yep. Now the thing is, charge on that capacitor has to be preserved. Yes. There's nowhere for the charge yeah. to go in a hurry, so charge is preserved. If we've increased the capacitance, mm -hmm. the voltage has to fall to keep the same energy, and indeed, that's exactly Absolutely. what happens. Exactly if we get happens. a pressure wave coming there, the voltage will go negative. Mm -hmm. If we have a rare fraction, the voltage will increase above the bias level. Yep. And those are the voltages that we're interested in gathering and amplifying as those AC voltages. Mm -hmm. they, they, respond to, they, they correspond to audio. Yep. The other thing to keep in mind is a positive pressure wave here results in a decrease, a negative going voltage. Mm -hmm. Something to keep in mind. Okay, uh, you can reverse that incidentally by putting a negative polarizing voltage there. Yep. In which case, 
If we have a negative polarising voltage on the capsule, then a positive pressure wave will indeed res uh, respond to a positive gain change mm -hmm. in the output voltage. Yes. So that's one way of getting the polarity the right way around if you really want to. Any other practical difference to the polarity? Mm. No. No, none. <laughs> none whatsoever. And uh, the other interesting thing is it doesn't matter whether you connect it as shown mm -hmm. or... Right. Let's put that over onto there yep. and ground that. Still the same thing. Mm -hmm. The signal on there, because the capacitance is reducing, will follow exactly that path. Yep. Okay. A positive gain pressure wave results in a decrease in voltage. Negative pressure, increase. Got so it. So it doesn't matter. And what it's about noise on our... What about noise on our... Uh, Bias voltage. Oh, we'll get into noise. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, we'll get into right. noise. A actually, the fascinating thing is high frequency noise uh -huh. coming out of it's, here yeah, yeah. is it's low pass filtered. Filtered, yes. Yeah. yes. With a, uh, the, the response of that low pass filter is, of course, flat to three hertz, and we've got a three hertz corner frequency. That's Sweet. 20 hertz divided by two yeah. pi. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I like it. So we do in fact get a, a noise reduction technique there. Having said that, mm -hmm. any sane designer of polarising supplies for these microphones yep. would make bloody sure that it was as noise free as they could get. Absolutely. So, okay, that's the basics of how you run an externally polarised microphone. Yes. And the difference with an electric microphone, just to cover it again, is that you don't apply an external charge, the charge is embedded in the material. Yes. Either itself. on yep. the wobbly bit or on the fixed electrode, it doesn't yep. matter. Usually in a bit of Teflon or something like that because they hold charge really well. Yes, same principle to apply yep. though, a exactly so. incoming yep. positive pressure wave yep. increases the capacitance and causes a decrease mm -hmm. in voltage. Excellent. All right. What do we do with them? Well, as we saw, we need to load these with a really, really high impedance buffer. Uh -huh. If you don't have a hugely yes. high impedance, uh, you're not going to get much out of them. And where do you get a high impedance from? <gasps> uh, well, you can either use, actually there's, we know. There, there's, there's two classes of components yeah. you can use. You can either use JFETs yep. or JFETs with pilot lights. <laughs> right, JFETs as in tubes. 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 Tubes, yes. Tubes. <laughs> <laughs> Yanks. All right. Incidentally, if we get old school about this, let, let, yep. let's uh, look at an uh, externally polarised capsule, mm -hmm. studio microphone type stuff. Okay, so we're looking at one of those without the electric material. Okay. Do, 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 do. We're feeding that beastie yep. from a polarising supply and a really, really high in, r impedance resistor, mm -hmm. probably about uh, one gig, yep. and that's going to be grounded. Okay, that's where our audio is occurring, but we need what, to... Why does it, non sequitur, hmm? why does it have to be such high voltage? Uh, if it, uh, the, the amount of charge mm -hmm. there determines the sensitivity of the microphone. Got it. <coughs> yeah. But you can't uh, make it arbitrarily high and arbitrarily No, in, indeed, you get some problems. Right. The higher you make that voltage, uh -huh. a couple of things happen. First of all, because that's positive and that's negative, they attract. Of so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yeah. You'll get that diaphragm <laughs> trying to bow in. Pop. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you get two different phenomena. Right. Phenomena number one is that gets so close to that that it decides to arc, arc over. over. Yep. Now, let's face it, when, you, when it arcs over, you get a massive transient there. <laughs> Whack! In, Whack. The, <laughs> in whatever system you're listening to. Not, yep. not pretty. Right. And then all of a sudden, of course, once that's discharged, it kind of springs back to yep. where it was before yep. and sucks in a whack. And it oscillates. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A couple yeah. of hertz or so. Yeah. Rel relaxation oscillator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, uh, in, incidentally, that's about the nastiest thing that can happen. A much yeah. more benign scenario mm. is uh, when that gets attracted so far, 
it gets so close, and you've still got that same voltage mm. there, that it actually decide, decides to just go stick. Mm. And pretty much right across the surface oh. of that diaphragm, yep. it sticks. And it won't unstick until you remove the polarising voltage by turning off the microphone. All right. And of course, when it sticks, it can't vibrate. Mm. So the microphone just goes deaf. Yep. So mm. it doesn't, does it physically damage them though? Uh, generally, Gosh. generally no. No, really? The reason being, I've grossly exaggerated the ratio oh, okay. of that right. diameter to yep. that distance. Got it. We're looking at typical uh, diaphragm to place mm -hmm. distances of maybe 10 microns, so, uh, oh, okay. 10, 10 right. micrometers. Right. So it's yep. really close. Mm -hmm. That deformation uh, doesn't hurt that much. Got it. Or it shouldn't. Okay. Uh, so that's a couple of the perils. However, prior to that occurring, you can go for your life and you can turn up the bias voltage mm -hmm. uh, because the the how do you put it? The sensitivity of the system in uh, pressure to voltage is linearly dependent on that bias voltage. Yep. So turn it up until it sparks or cracks. Right. There you go. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, actually, turn it up until it sparks or cracks at the highest oh, SPL you're going to be using it at. <laughs> <Right>. Yes. <coughs> because that will add to some movement. So is that typically uh, an adjustable? Um, voltage that you could tweak in your system, uh, or you generally wouldn't touch it? You would generally not touch it. Uh, yep. If you were clever enough to dive into a microphone and start mucking about with the bias right. voltage, yes, you could right. tweak it. <coughs> it's uh, generally not that adjustable though, because mm -hmm. uh, well, back in the good old days, that voltage there was simply derived from the same power supply that was used to drive your tubes. Got it. And decreasing it would be easy, just mm -hmm. use a pot. Increasing it, well, you'd have to have the voltage there to increase it in the first yep. place. Yeah. Uh, in later times, uh, various designs involving uh, oscillators and step-up transformers mm -hmm. were involved. Uh, the method that I tended to use when I was at Rode Microphones was a CMOS oscillator. Really, really dumb. Uh, yeah. CMOS oscillator, you know, usual, usual resistor, resistor, capacitor type arrangement. Yep. Just so that you've got a fairly well determined frequency of oscillation. Whack that through another couple of stages of that, and then feed that into a modified variant of a uh, voltage multiplier. Yes. And the Easy. thing is, you can actually go two phase on there if you. You can. You can be a sneaky bugger. Yep, because we've yeah. got alternate phases on we that do. output and that, that output. Uh, some of them onto there, keep on going. Mm -hmm. And I typically use uh, a number of stages of multiplication there to right. step, say, 12 or 15 DC supply to these 4000 series CMOS mm -hmm. up to 60 volts, 90 volts, whatever. And how would you clean that up? Oh, by the time you come out here, it's Remember, yeah. what's th what's the actual current consumption oh, out of there? It's nothing. It's zero. It's zero. It's zero, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> in principle, it requires absolutely no clean up at right. all. But of uh, let's face it, yep. uh, one meg of resistance yep. and a couple of nanofarad capacitance and is bingo, Bob's your uncle. all that's required. Yep. So, nice. it's intrinsic. In fact, the only real source of noise over there would be any. Uh, relatively low frequency variation to the DC supply there of because course, that yep. will cause that to wander oh, and that represents a noise source. It would mainly be temperature dependent or something like that. Uh, we, zenas. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody zenas. <laughs> Quite often this will be a zena derived yeah. supply. Right. Okay, from a higher voltage. <laughs> you crude bastards. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you, you, you wouldn't chuck a regulator in there because actually regulators yeah. are probably going to be noisier than yeah. a good Xena. Of course. Yeah. And the issue here is if you've got a Xena with a soft knee, mm -hmm. it's actually going to be quieter than a hard knee one. And uh, by knee, I'm talking about, yes. if we're talking about, uh, I can't remember, uh, let's call that uh, current versus voltage. Uh, a soft knee Zener would look a bit like that. Mm -hmm. So 
that's your regulated voltage there. Yep. A hard knee zener would be much more likely to be like that. Mm -hmm. The hard knee low impedance ones seem to be way noisier than the soft knee ones. Well, that's what we found at the time. Right. After we got some uh, hard knee zeners inadvertently, put oh. them in and discovered that they were noisy, noisy, noisy brutes. There you go. And they didn't make them into production, did they? Uh, Actually, they made it. We did about a hundred, and then kind of realised, hang on, these aren't passing muster on noise mm. because we were testing for noise. Yep. What the hell's going on? Why are these different to the last ones? And got it down to the zeners. Sure. Worse still, because the hard knee zeners have a low impedance mm -hmm. than lower impedance than the soft knee ones. It doesn't matter how much capacitance you put across them. Mm. You're, you're not gonna, really going to shut them up because. Yep. You've got a low impedance exactly. in that capacitor, and, and it no, just doesn't clean up. Yeah. The soft knee ones clean up beautifully. Mm -hmm. Meh, go figure. There you go. Uh, so that was simply a, a lesson learnt along the way in low noise electronics. Uh, if you're going to zener regulate, pick something that's got a fairly soft knee. And the mm -hmm. other thing is, if you're going to filter your zener, don't filter it there. Yes. Duh. That's a low impedance point. Add some impedance and decouple it over here, yep. where you can actually form an RC Absolutely. low pass filter yeah. to denoise it. Yeah, because that uh, CMOS, uh, CMOS oscillator is going to take bugger all anyway. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. yeah. So you can use kilohms yeah, there. Yeah, I know, you can use a couple of K. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. just sits there and boogies. Excellent. Yeah. So that so. was a typical circuit inside a, a road production. Yeah. Yep, Mike. and still used to this day, to the best of my knowledge. Right. When I first came there, though, they were not based on this kind of CMOS oscillator. Mm -hmm. They were a transistor oscillator with three discrete inductors hung around it and basically relied on getting a 12 or 15 volt supply. And look, I actually can't remember the circuit topology for this oscillator, but it was a real nasty thing mm -hmm. and not at all deterministic. There you go. And it required on the particular transistor having oh, <coughs> a, no. a fairly specific gain oh, no. and no. VCE no, and no, no. <laughs> so Production they're all it's going to be all over the shop. Well, and what varies yeah. as a result? Mm -hmm. The sensitivity of the microphone. Oh. It's the one thing you don't want to vary is the sensitivity of the mic. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Oh boy. Alrighty, so we're back to this microphone circuit where we've created some audio superimposed on DC there. Right. What are we going to do with that, of course? We're going to capacitor couple it out to our amplifier, mm -hmm. which also needs to have its bias condition set by a resistor going to whatever bias voltage we want. Yep. That might be ground, might, might be, be a few volts. Depends. Yeah. Whatever. Depends on what supply you got here for your amp and whatnot. Yeah. Yep. Things to remember: that capacitor has to be, yeah, you know, way larger than that capacitance there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> talking a couple hundred nano or something. Yeah. A, a few nan. Well, a few nano. Given that that's say around about fifty puff. puff yep. A nanofarad would do just fine. Right. And typically one to ten nanofarads is what you'd see there. Yep. What value does that need to be? Well, it's, yeah. at least the same order of <laughs> exactly. magnitude as that, because as far as audio there is concerned, yeah. that thing and that thing appear in parallel. They do. And uh, back in the good old days of valve microphones and not a lot of knowledge, uh, typical resistances there might have only been about 100 mega ohms. Yep. Okay, that order of magnitude. The amplifier here might have been uh, a tube. Yep. And that would go to supply, output transformer, and that goes off to mm -hmm. the rest of the system. And in fact, the very first microphone that I was designed at Rode Microphones was a tube microphone. It actually had a had a tube in there. Yeah. In J, the... J fit with a pilot light. Yep. Right, yeah. Stuck in the end of the Yeah. <laughs> Incidentally, <laughs> there, there are real advantages in yeah. ha, in having a valve, a tube, up in the head with the microphone. 
Why is that? Why? Because you're providing it with filament power, mm -hmm. and it's the filament power that makes that thing warm, yep. and it's that warmth that keeps the whole thing dehumidified. Ah. You're dealing with high impedances here, so you nice. really want to yes. keep it uh, dry, not right. humid. You want to discourage... Interesting uh -huh. side benefit. And nice. indeed when, uh, oh, I think that this might be an anecdote going back to maybe the 60s or 70s when Brule and Kerr decided to go solid state instead of valve, mm. they discovered that they were having all kinds of problems in their measurement mics with humidity build up so they, mm. because they'd taken out the tube, the tube, so they actually had to put heater resistors in there. <laughs> they put a resistive yeah. heater. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, oh, terrific. One of the uh, ugly things about this kind mm. of circuit uh, is the fact that the output impedance of valves is really quite high. Mm. That means that whatever load you put over here, you know, whatever yep. you, your mixer, console, or mm -hmm. whatever, whatever it is that you're using over there, its load impedance will change the gain yes. of the whole thing. And if you've got a load over here that's non-linear with frequency, for example, if it's you know, heavily capacitive or something like that, your frequency response is going to droop because it's being fed by quite a significant mm -hmm. impedance. Yep. In this first mic that I designed at Rode, the Classic 2, I was heretical. Oh. I was a bad, bad what did you do? boy. First of all, do that, then do Sick that. College. <laughs> <laughs> then capacitor couple that into yeah. your transformer <laughs> and guess what you get a nice low impedance drive point you do because it's an emitter yeah. follow-up yeah. Yeah. and it, do, it doesn't do anything to interfere with the yeah. tubish uh, linearities or non-linearities of that mm. it's just a dumb voltage follow-up did you get a tube sound oh yes yes excellent excellent Interestingly enough, on this particular microphone, part of the what I reckon everybody called the tube sound was mm. created by the fact that in be, instead of being a skinny little runt of a microphone like this, mm. damn thing was about that kind of diameter. It was right. hugely meaty <laughs> yeah. and had this quite large uh, mesh covering mm. over the capsule. So you were, you were never up close and personal to the right. capsule, even if you were a crooner. Yeah. Uh, you were always kind of at least the, uh, the radius of this shell <laughs> away right. from it, uh -huh. and it made it sound all spacey and airy, Got and it. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and that was just the physical yeah. construction of the mic, yeah. forcing people not to. Yeah, they couldn't right. get their gobs up to it, so <laughs> it sounded more better. <laughs> Brilliant. Incidentally, that follower there yep. also allowed me to put some filter circuitry in there mm. so we could either get it uh, flat as possible or a bit of low pass filtering or a bit more, uh, sorry, high, right. high pass filtering. Switchable, so, so switchable high pass filters. Switch yeah. yep. But uh, yeah, the fact that it had a bit of bipolar in there was heretical. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, unbelievable. Incidentally, uh, transistor just, uh, I think it was a, uh, a 2N5401 or one of those right. uh, 120 volt 150 volt class transistors mm -hmm. because the supply was only about 120 to 150 volts. Yep. So we could get away with uh, a fairly high gain, fairly low noise transistor there and yeah, it just worked a treat. Brilliant. Mm.